This is Case Closed, crime stories from the golden age of radio. Welcome back to Case Closed. Thanks for joining me this week. We'll hear first this time from the adventures of Sam Spade. We'll hear the bow window caper from November 9th, 1947. After that, it's Damsel in Distress from Box 13. That story was first heard November 14th, 1948. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Sam Spade Detective Agency. Hello, sweetheart. It's only me. Oh, why so modest? Women, Effie. Age cannot weather nor custom stale their infinite variety. Huh? Against their incalculable wiles, mere man is a leaf in the wind. Oh, Sam, do you really... Oh. Who was she and how windy was it? Cyclonic, Effie. We had to close every window in the house. But I... If you will just contain your natural feminine curiosity for a few moments, I'll be right down to dictate my report on the bow window caper. Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. To every man who says, I don't use a hair tonic, or I don't believe in a hair tonic, I say this. Decide for yourself, but don't decide until you've tried Wild Root Cream Oil, the entirely different hair tonic. There's not a drop of alcohol in Wild Root Cream Oil, and it contains soothing lanolin. What's more, it grooms your hair the right way, neatly and naturally. So get the big economy-sized bottle and the handy new tube at your drug or toilet goods counter. Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. A bow window is a bay window that you look into instead of out of. Look into instead of out? Oh. Oh, Sam. <laughs> Get your book, Panther Girl, and slink on in. Well, what was she trying to see through the, the, the bow window? Hmm? I mean, whose house was it? Her own. But if it was her own house, then why would she... Well, it just at... goes to show you, darling, what some women will stoop to. It does? Mm-hmm. It was a low window. Oh. Well, whenever you're ready, Sam. Uh, date, November 10th. Ninth. Ninth. Uh, correct. 1947. To Dr. Helmut Reese. I was right for once. Yeah. From Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the bow window caper. Dear Dr. Reese, I know that this report will not make pleasant reading for you, but you paid for it, so here it is. As far as I was concerned, it all started on Thursday morning when you called at my office. From your story, I gathered it had been going on for some time. You, you will say these are merely the actions of a jealous woman, Mr. Spade. But I assure you there's more to it than that. It is, it, it, it must be a carefully thought out plan to ruin my career, my, my whole life. In uh, what way, Dr. Reese? She spies on my private consultations. Insults my women patients. I can no longer even keep a nurse for more than a week at a time. Scenes, hysterics, she outbursts of violence. I cannot continue my work under such conditions. Well, why don't you give her a divorce? Why, no, no, no. This is not her desire. If it were, it would be, it would be simple. No, she wants to bring me to ruin. She wants to see me on my knees in front of the popular. Why? That is what I want to find out. Why? Doctor, I think you ought to take this case to a head doctor. I have consulted a psychiatrist. The examiner. She's perfectly competent mentally. 
So you see there is here already some mystery. For which one comes to a detective? Uh, how long has this been going on, Dr. Reed? Since three months only. But in this time, she has reduced me to utter desolation. Dr. Reese was a very good divorce lawyer right down the hall from my office. No, no, no. I discussed the matter of a divorce with her a few days back. This was her answer. Uh, You see, a receipt for the purchase of a gun. And this note in her handwriting. I hope you will not force me to use this. Esther. Yes. What do you think she has in mind? Murder or suicide? She refused to discuss it. But one thing I have noticed. Since she has bought this gun, a new development, a strange man watches my house. Several times I have caught him following me. Well, she might have hired a detective to check on whether you visit a lawyer. Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps it is very simple, but it is all too strange to be harmed. I uh, half-heartedly agreed that it might be, Dr. Reese, and when you check for 100 bucks didn't bounce, I went to work wholeheartedly. I reached your house on Pacific Avenue just as the street lights were going on. It's a quiet neighborhood, so I could hear it before I got close enough to read the number on the door. Get out! Get out of this house! Get out! They seem to be slugging their way toward the back of the house, so I decided to risk an entrance. I found the doorbell, and I was about to punch it when I caught sight of your mystery man. He was crossed in a clump of shrubbery that grew under the bow window at the corner of the house. He was still there with his eyes glued to the window when I walked up behind him. Hey, let go of me. Let go. Come on, come on. You're going inside. Listen, I'm not just a snooper. I'm I only... didn't say you were. I'm just inviting you inside for a better look. Now, I'm warning you. If you don't let go of me, I'm... Stop squirming, will you? Go! Oh! The kick he landed on me wasn't according to the wrestling association's rules, but I let him get away with it, mainly because I couldn't move for three or four minutes, and by that time, he disappeared down the street. When I recovered my faculties and staggered back to the door, I didn't bother ringing the bell. I just walked in. The hen fight was still going on somewhere in the upper reaches of the house. Then a door burst open on the upper landing, and a girl in a nurse's uniform ran down the stairs toward me... Pursued by a pale little woman with a pinched face who was brandishing a pair of brass fire tongs. You brushed past me, Dr. Reese, and headed off the pursuer. Esther, stop it! Stop it at once! Have you gone crazy? Give me those fire tongs! Give them to me! What's the matter, Helmut? Afraid I'll mar your light of love's beauty? What started this? I caught her creeping about the kitchen. She was going to poison my food. Explain to you, Mrs. Reese. The doctor said. Oh, don't, don't, don't bother explaining, Miss Robbins. These morbid fancies of hers. Don't think I don't know what goes on in that office. That office where I'm not allowed anymore. That's only because you make the patient so nervous, Esther. I know what goes on. You and those women. That will do, Esther. Go to your room. Very well. But I won't have that woman in this house another day, Helmut. Is that understood? Go to your room, Esther. I'm going. I'm going. But remember what I said. I warned you both. I can't. There, there, Miss Swabbins. Now don't. There. I can't. Any more, Doctor. I tell you, it's making me a nervous <clears throat> wreck. I just... Uh, Dr. Reese. Huh? Oh, Mrs. Spade. You saw, you heard? Yeah. Uh, uh, come into my office. We'll talk. I think we'd better. Uh, doctor, there's still one more patient waiting for you, Doctor. Well, uh, have her wait a little longer. Uh, uh, this, this way, Mrs. Spade. Nurse, how much longer? Oh, the doctor wait. will see you just as soon as he possibly can. Have you been feeling any better, Mrs. Campbell? Uh, sit down, Mrs. Spade. Thanks, but I can say what I have to say standing. Your wife's a very tragic woman, Doctor. Uh, I wish I could help her. I wish I could help you, too. But I can't. You heard her threat against Miss Robbins. Was that a joke? There's nothing funny about jealousy. Uh, but there is this man who watches the house. And the gun she bought. I collared him outside just now. Oh, well, did you get him to talk? No, but I wouldn't worry about him if I were you. And about that gun. The Constitution says every citizen shall have the right to bear arms. Even Parnell Thomas can't do uh, Mr. Spade, I've not yet told you all. If I... Oh, Doctor, I'm, I'm sorry yes. to interrupt, but this patient, she's been waiting for more than an hour. Well, who, who is she? Mrs. Cavanaugh. Cavanaugh? Cavanaugh, who? Well, has she been here before? Of course, last week. Here, here's her card. Oh, oh yes, yes. Uh, uh, I'd, I'd better get it over. Uh, send her in. Yes, Doctor. And, and Doctor, 
I'm resigning. I'll finish the day, of course, and, and then I'm through. I'm, I'm sorry. Yes, yes, well, very well, Miss Robbins. I, I, I can't say that I blame you. Good luck. Goodbye, Doctor. Well, I'll be going along myself now, Doctor. Uh, no, 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 no. You must hear me out, Mr. Spade. I have not yet told all. If now, if you'll just wait until I have seen this patient, uh, please, Mr. Spade, please. Okay, I'll wait outside. Oh, I beg your pardon. I beg yes. your... Uh, c- come on in. So, uh, you're leaving the doctor's employ, uh, nurse? I am, I am. Well, Mr. Spade, how does it look from the grandstand? Messy? Mm-hmm. You don't mind if I finish cleaning out his desk? Go right ahead. Thank you. What's the matter with Esther, anyway? I could sum the whole thing up in a single five-letter word, shall I? You have. Are you going to walk out on him? Aren't you? Yes. Yes, I am. Oh, but Esther isn't jealous of your type, if you don't mind my mentioning it. I feel heartened to think that you noticed I was different. Oh, I did, Mr. Spade. I really did. You don't seem uh, particularly nursy to me, either. I'm not. My, you have a fast pulse, Mr. Spade. Uh, yes, I've uh, been feeling very weak the last few minutes. I uh, need care. Oh, you know, you don't eat enough apples, Mr. Spade. Well, I guess I've finished. Oh, there's that old contact. I wonder. Mr. Spade, will you tell the doctor I've left and thank him for me again? Aren't you going to see him before you go? No, no, I'm not. It only begged me to stay, and it's, well, it's simply out of the question. Oh, the poor guy. I just don't know what I'd do if I were in his place. For you, Mr. Spade. I did, and I told her. She told me I was a victim of hypertension and left me with my mouth open and no thermometer in it. Five minutes after she'd gone out through the front entrance, your wife came down the stairs looking knowingly at me and the door to the doctor's office and left by the same route. Ten minutes after that, I was halfway through a 1937 National Geographic that was the latest edition on the waiting room table, and it reached the third paragraph on the natural beauties of Winona County, Minnesota. But I never finished it. I will be back in a minute. First thing I saw when I entered the room was Mrs. Cavanaugh, your patient patient. What? Why didn't he do it? You, doctor, were standing over her, nervously twitching off the rubber glove from your right hand. You tested her throat for pulse, then listened to a stethoscope. It was purely a formality. One of the 38 caliber slugs had entered the right temple. The other had torn through the base of the skull. How did it happen? I, I don't know. I had completed the examination and walked over there to put my instruments away. When I turned when I turned back, she had a gun in her hand. Before I could stop her, she pulled the trigger. Suicide, of course. Why? Well, I just told her the truth, that there was nothing I or any other doctor could do for her. That she had perhaps a month, perhaps less. She had suffered great pain, of course, for some time. Uh-huh. You saw her shoot herself, you say? Yes, yes. The gun, she took it out of my desk drawer. I'd removed it from my wife's room earlier today. I see. Well, Doctor, this is the neatest suicide I ever saw. No powder burns, and from the way she's lying, she must have shot herself in the direction of that window, at least ten feet away. She screamed before the shots were fired and had time to fire a second bullet into her head and throw the gun across the room before she fell. Well, Helma, at last it's happened, hasn't it? Esther, leave this room. I told Helmuth one of the husbands would catch up with him. Pretty, wasn't she? I don't remember this one. The expression on your face might have been horror or fear or both, Dr. Reese. But your wife was smiling. When my eyes left her face, I noticed a leaf clinging to the hem of her coat. It might have come from the shrub that grew up against the house. And her shoes were splashed with mud that could have and probably did come from the cultivated flower bed just outside the bow window. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade.
Now, here's important news on good grooming. Better than four out of five users of Wild Root Cream Oil say they prefer Wild Root Cream Oil to all other hair tonics. Here is new and even more conclusive evidence that Wild Root Cream Oil is again and again the choice of men who put good grooming first. So if you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. And no wonder, it gives you the advantages that men consider most important. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, and removes loose dandruff. What's more, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil is the only leading hair tonic that contains soothing lanolin. That's like the oil of your skin. So ask for Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, back to the bow window caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. Obviously, there were two equally good suspects in the Kavanaugh murder. Either your wife had killed her in a jealous rage, or you'd killed her with your wife's gun to frame her for the murder. I decided to let the police worry it out and went home to bed. The morning headlines were a bit of a surprise. Nurse sought in shooting a mystery woman, item. The cops had found Celeste Robbins' fingerprints all over the murder gun. And item, Mrs. Cavanaugh, the murdered woman, had given a vacant lot as her address, and her body was lying unclaimed at the morgue. I decided to pay her a visit. Maxie, hey, Maxie. What? Oh, Sam. Sammy, my boy. Hey, it's good to look on you. How are you, Maxwell? Oh, fine, fine. What brings you here, Sam? The Kavanaugh woman. The Kavanaugh? Oh, Kavanaugh, huh? Well, uh, let's see who's with us today. Uh, Stiftle, Milton, Schwartz, Kelly. I knew him. Nice guy. Feige. Aha. Uh-huh. Kavanaugh. Rose. Hello, Rose. Hey, Sam, don't you want to look at Rose? No, I've seen her. Ah. Uh, yeah, just checked her back in. Autopsy. Say, you do collect queer ones, Sam. Mm. Now, you take her. Why would anybody in the world knock her off? In her condition, all he needed to do was wait. A month, a couple of weeks. Bad as that, huh? Worse. Anybody claim her yet? Well, that... Hello. Something we can do for you? My name is Kavanaugh. I've come for my wife. He was standing with his back to me, and I didn't get a good look at his face until he walked over to the desk with Master. The voice tipped me even before I saw the face. It was a man I'd caught outside your office window less than half an hour before the murder. If he recognized me, he didn't let it show. I waited while he went in with Maxie. When he came out, there were tears streaming down his face. I'd been waiting for two reasons. I had had some questions to ask him, and I had wanted to pay back that jolt he'd given me the night before. I left without doing either. Oh, hello, Sam. Oh, sweetheart, any calls? Lieutenant Dundee of Homicide, yeah. uh, Dr. Reese, mm-hmm. and there's a girl waiting inside. Wouldn't give any names. So you let her wait in my private office. Well, I don't think you'll mind when you've seen her. She's by way of being a knockout. Well, uh... Thank you, Effie. That was uh, very thoughtful of you, Dan. You're welcome, Sam. Sam, please, please don't be angry with me for coming here. I had to talk to somebody. What you need is a good criminal lawyer, Miss Robert. Oh, no. Oh, no. Do you think I killed that woman? How did your prince get on that gun? And don't tell me she threatened you with it and you grabbed it out of her hand. No, no, I didn't. I did nothing oh, at all. Take it easy, nurse. Take it easy. Would you like a drink or something? No, no. Thank you, anyway. I'll, I'll be all right. Well... She came in from shopping three days ago, just as nice as pie. And she came creeping around. You know how she is. And she said, I bought something today. It's lovely. And with that, she hauled this gun out of her handbag. And so, to humor her, I took it and I looked at it. That was foolish. It certainly was foolish. Well, nickel plated, I deal service for fingerprints. And I remember she was wearing gloves. Struck me as peculiar at the time, but I'm, I'm so stupid. 
I didn't think of it until just now. Everything's a little peculiar about this caper. A woman who was dying anyway gets shot. Nobody even seems to know who she was. Doesn't make sense. No, no, it doesn't make much sense. But what should I do, Sam? Give myself up? I think you should. Yes, I thought you'd say that. All right, phone the police. You got a lot of courage. Sure you don't want to drink? No. No, thank you. I'll be all right. I'll be all right. Homicide. Dundee. Uh, Dundee. Sam Spade. I got the Robbins girl here in my office. She wants to check in. Oh? Uh, well, tell her to forget it, Sam. Reese's wife just made a full confession. That tore it. In my anxiety to see how you were bearing up under the shock, Doctor, I blew a buck and a half of your money on a taxi all the way out to your address on Pacific Avenue. To my astonishment, you were wearing a look of real distress. I I don't understand it, Mr. Spade. This confessing, it's it's not like her. It's all too strange to be harmed. Dr. Reeves, I'd like to talk to you alone. Do you mind, Mr. Spade? Go right ahead. <clears throat> I strained my ears outside your consulting room, but all I could hear was a few vague murmurs. Then, for no good reason, I decided to have a look at your wife's bedroom upstairs. The cops had been there before me, so I didn't expect to find much, and I didn't. I was tapping the woodwork for secret panels or something when I heard a heavy tread on the, on the stairway. I wheeled around, my hands inside my coat. A jolly-looking character in coveralls was standing in the doorway. Home electronics. I beg your pardon? Go hang it. Home electronics. <laughs> I come to take the equipment. What equipment? A dictograph. She don't need it no more. <laughs> Ask me, she hurt too much. Mrs. Reese had a dictograph installed? Yeah, her metal type installation. Yeah, this here's a speaker. <laughs> yeah, my own design. Looks like a portable radio, don't it? Yeah, where's the other end? Where's the uh, microphone? It's in the doc's private office. Uh, you interested, eh? Yeah, I'll turn it on, will you? Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah, we'll get it tuned in a minute there. Yeah. Oh, feedback. Wait a minute, I'll fix it. Let her talk. Let her talk. What can she tell? I don't know. But it's uncanny the way she means things. Every word we spoke together. <laughs> it's because of the dictograph. They rig, eh? Shut up. We cannot allow this terrible tragedy to come between us. We love each other. Nothing can change that. Oh, boy. Yeah, that's as nice, ain't it? Quiet, quiet. I just know, please, please, don't. Now, now stop it, Holmes. I don't want you. Please, don't. What is it, Celeste? What has happened to Jake? What has happened? You ask that. When I've been attacked by a mad woman and accused of murder all in the space of 12 hours. But it's all over now. Just so, Hilton. Yes, all over. Would you turn it up a little more? Oh, sure, sure. Turn it up. Hold it, hold it. It's over. And I'm very, very ashamed. I suppose it was my usual thing. I always get sorry for a poor, weak man and get involved. But this time, I'm sorry for her. Celeste, please. When I was a kid, I liked it. It used to make me feel powerful and, well, to watch them squirm. But it's no fun anymore watching another woman in the agonies of jealousy. And you, I thought you were just weak. You're a brutal, unscrupulous murderer. What are you saying, Celeste? You killed Mrs. Cavanaugh. Why, that's... That's impossible. You stood deliberately in that window and you fired two shots right at Hey, what gives you? Why weren't my fingerprints on that gun? Because you were wearing your rubber gloves, Doctor. Celeste, don't play anymore. No, no. (laughs) Here, help me. Help me get his shirt off, Mr. Spain. You've been shot. Who shot him, you? Through the window, the same man, the one who watched the house. Hold, hold this tourniquet tight, please. Uh, nothing. A flesh wound. His aim was bad. Yeah, too bad. <laughs> Cavanaugh, he's still out there? You got nothing to worry about, he's still alive. I missed him. Give me a hand. Come on. That's it. I missed him. That was lucky. You're taking the rap of your wife's murder, too, if you're a better shot. He did it. He killed my wife. I was at the window. I saw him. What I don't understand is why his wife confessed. She loves him, Mr. Cavanaugh. You should understand that. I guess that's what happens to love when it gets crossed up. Why didn't you tell the police what you saw? I, they'd have hung it on me. She she was a stranger to everyone else. I'd been quarreling with her, suspicious, acting like a maniac. She never told me. 
She must have been going to one doctor after another, trying to find one that would give her one ray of hope. In pain all the time, too, and never letting on. Never. Even after that first visit she made to Reese's office, I didn't tumble. I, I thought she was meeting him on the sly. And I followed her both times. That last time I carried a gun. I might have killed her if what I suspected had been true. Uh, I'm very sorry, Mr. Cabano. I, I didn't realize. You're pretty late with your regrets, Doctor. I don't quite figure you either. Maybe the prison psychiatrist can. Dundee homicide. Uh, Dundee, tear up Mrs. Reese's confession. Come on over and get the doctor. Dr. Reese? Yeah. Uh, uh, oh, by the way, he accidentally shot himself in the arm. Isn't that right, Doctor? What? So, yes, yes. Accident. Why didn't she tell me? Why didn't she tell me? I don't know, Kavanaugh. Women. Sometimes they make too much sense, or we don't make enough, or maybe we're all crazy. <laughs> And that, Dr. Reese, is the crop. At the risk of laboring a point, there's also the mystery of why a nice girl like Celeste Robbins ever fell for a guy like you. You'll have plenty of free time to think it over between now and the trial. If you find the answer, drop me a line. Period. End of report. You know, Sam, that, that Celeste, I like her. I wish we could do something for her. Well, I've already thought of that, Evie. Oh? What are you going to do, Sam? Write that up, sweetheart, and I'll write you a happy ending. Here's how you can find out whether the hair tonic you're using today is giving you what you ought to get in good grooming. Ask yourself, does my present hair tonic groom my hair neatly and naturally, or does it leave my hair sticky or greasy? And does it relieve dryness and remove loose dandruff too, or does it do just a halfway job? Unless you can honestly say that your present hair tonic does all that for your hair, you owe it to yourself to try Wild Root Cream Oil right away. Try Wild Root Cream Oil and see for yourself how it improves your appearance. Grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose dandruff. It's non-alcoholic and contains soothing lanolin. Get the big economy size bottle and the handy new tube that's easy to pack when you travel and grand for the bathroom cabinet. Don't delay. Get it today. Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Oh, here's the report, Sam. Do you want to read it over? I do not. File it under F. But forget. About that poor Celeste, Sam. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, I made a date with Celeste to take her dancing tomorrow night. She uh, needs cheering up, you know. Well, what for? Well, you said she needed help. Well, that isn't exactly the kind of help I had in mind. Oh. I don't see why it's necessary Effie, to take... we must each of us give what particular kind of help each of us is particularly equipped to give. Very well. She wished to... She used to make over men just to get the other women jealous. That she did. Aren't other women silly to allow themselves to get jealous when they know just what she's up to? Idiotic. Just idiotic. Sure thing. And go home, Effie. I'm a lousy dancer. Oh, very well. Have fun, Sam. Good night, Sam. <laughs> Good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd, with musical direction by Lud Gluskin. This is Dick Joy, reminding you that next Sunday, author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade, brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again... The choice of men who put good grooming first. Smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too, for quick good grooming and to relieve dryness between permanents. Mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13, care of the Star Times. I am desperately in danger, I'm sure. 
I'm afraid to go to the police right now. So if you'll really go any place and do anything like your ad said. If you'll really go any place and do anything like your ad says, please meet me tomorrow at 6 in the evening at the corner of Gateway and Lakeview Boulevards. Constance McLean. Hmm. You didn't know it then, but this was one time holiday you had your work cut out for you. And now, back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure. I guess I was asking for it when I put that ad in the Star Times. But I wasn't asking for what happened this time, and I don't want it again. You see, it was... Well, might as well start from the beginning, and Susie saying... Constance McLean. That's a pretty name, Mr. Holliday. Hmm. But what do you make of the letter, Susie? Make of it? Well, what do you mean? Well, take this line. I'm desperately in danger, I'm sure. Well, what about it? No, it sounds like something from an old melodrama. But it's thrilling. Maybe she is desperately in danger, Mr. Holliday. Why don't you find out? You think I should, huh? Sure. You'll be just like one of the old night irritants. <laughs> Night's errand, Susie. What's the difference? They both hunted for trouble, didn't they? Well, what's good enough for a night errand is good enough for me. I'm sorry I can't oblige you by dashing off on a white charge and wearing a tin suit. <laughs> but so long anyway, Susie. The intersection of Gateway and Lakeview Boulevards was in the fashionable suburb of the city. The kind of a neighborhood where money is the root of the most important family trees. I looked at my watch. It was six exactly. Then I heard someone coming... I waited. It was about dark. The shadows of the trees kept me from seeing who it was whispering. But a couple of seconds later... I... Uh, hello. Oh, good evening. You're uh, Constance McLean. Oh, no. No, my name's Barbara Rodney. Uh, Constance is over there. Oh, I see. Well, I'm, I'm box 13. Uh-huh. Well, what's the matter? You're different. From what? From what we thought. You mean to tell me you got me all the way out here to see what I look like? Oh, no, not at all, Mr. Thirteen. I mean, well, what is your name? Dan Holliday. Oh, that's nice. Wait a minute. Come on, honey. He's very nice. Oh, come on. He's right up here. Mr. Holliday, this is Constance. Connie? How do you do? How are you? She stared at me and I stared back. She was about 17, not pretty, but kind of a hungry face and eyes. I smiled at her, and she smiled back. It's awfully nice of you to come, Mr. Holliday. Well, not at all. I think anyone would come on the strength of your letter, Connie. Can we go someplace and talk? I mean, we can't stand here on the corner, can we? We could, but sitting would be better. What do you suggest? How about... How about Smudgy Mary's? I beg your pardon? Well, Connie means Smudgy Mary's place. Oh. Oh, I thought for a moment you said Smudgy Mary's. We can sit down there. They have tables, and we can talk. I've got to talk to you, Mr. Holliday. Uh, Just a minute, Connie. What kind of a place is this Smudgy Mary's? It's nice. They serve ice cream and sundaes and malts. Oh, well, swell. Let's go. Is it within walking distance, or do we go in my car? Well, we can walk, can't we, Connie? Well... If you think it's safe for me. Safe? What's the matter? We'll go in your car, Mr. Holliday. On the way to Smudgy Mary's, I tried to draw Connie out. But she was determined to wait until we got to that paradise of ice cream and malts. The two kids chattered away, and I gathered they both went to a fashionable and ultra-ultra finishing school in the neighborhood. Then I found myself in Smudgy Mary's. Kids were all over. Nice-looking kids. And the usual jukebox. Connie and Barbara guided me to a table in the back, and we sat down. What'll you have, Mr. Holliday? Huh, what's especially of Spongy Mary's? You want one? Mm, if you do, Connie. I... No, I don't think so. Just a lemonade. Barbara? Mm, a double malt with chocolate ice cream and whipped cream on top. 
I'll go over and tell Mary. <laughs> we call her Smudgy because she's always got a smudge on her nose. I'll be right back. All right, Connie. Want to talk now? I... Here, you read this. She took a crumpled piece of paper from her handbag, shoved it across the table to me. I opened it. There was a message that read, If you don't get a thousand dollars from your parents, they'll never see you again. The letters were cut from magazine and newspaper print. I read it twice, then asked, How did you get this, Connie? It, it came to the school for me. When? Yesterday, just before I wrote the letter to you, Mr. Holiday. Who knows about this? Just Barbara. She's my best friend. Now you. All right, Connie. As soon as we leave here, we're going to the police. Oh, no, please. Please, Mr. Holiday, we mustn't. Why not? Well, if I did, well, well, Mother would have to know. Don't you think she should? No, she mustn't. Why not? Well, she... She isn't well, Mr. Holiday. With something like this, it would... Well, it would make her worse. But this is very serious, Connie. Can you help me? Now, look, Connie. You're not helping other girls who may be in your position someday. Let the person who wrote this get away with it this time, and he'll try it again. Mr. Holiday, if you go to the police, I'll, I'll kill myself. I stared hard at her. Her face was more hungry than ever, and her eyes were scared. Then Barbara came back with the orders. Here we are. I brought you a specialty, Mr. Holiday. Uh, thanks, Barbara. Babs, Mr. Holiday wants to go to the police. <gasps> Sit down, Barbara. Yes, sir. Now, Connie, have you anything else to tell me? Well, I... I today, someone called me on the phone. It, it was a man's voice. He said, I should have the money by the day after tomorrow or, or I'd be sorry. That's right, Mr. Holiday. I was there when the man called. Did you recognize his voice, Connie? No, I never heard it before, I'm sure. It, it had kind of an accent. Do you know anyone that speaks like that? No, I, I said I didn't recognize him. Where are your father and mother? They're, they're away. Where? In, in Michigan. For how long? They'll be gone about two months. I see. This man said you'd have to get the money by the day after tomorrow, is that right? Yes. Well, Mr. Holiday, I'm scared. Why are you afraid to go to the police, Connie? I'm afraid of what will happen if I do. To you? Yes, to me. Yes, she was scared, all right. She didn't touch a lemonade, and I couldn't touch the specialty of the house. You see, I wanted to be alive the next day. A little while later, we left Smudgy Mary's. We didn't say much. Connie, because she was scared. Barbara, because she was scared. And I... Because, well, I had an idea. It was after eight when we pulled up in front of the school where they lived in the dormitory. Connie and Barbara got out of the car. What should I do, Mr. Holliday? You sure that man said day after tomorrow? Oh, yes, I know he did. Hmm. All right, Connie, I'll do what I can. You'll help her, Mr. Holliday? Of course I will, Barbara. Now you two run along. I'll wait till you get inside. Go on now. I don't know how to thank you. Don't try. Just take it easy and don't worry. All right. Good night, Mr. Holliday. Good night, Connie. Barbara. Good night. I watched them until they went in. I was about to close the car door and drive away Mr. when... Mr. Holliday! Oh, Mr. Holliday! That was Connie. It didn't take long to cover the distance to the dormitory entrance. Oh, Connie! Barbara! Oh, Mr. Holliday! Look! It was under my door. This. Another letter. Give it to me quick. Oh, here comes Miss Ogilvy. She's head mistress. Oh, please, Mr. Holliday, don't show her that letter. Please, don't tell. I don't know why I stuck that letter in my pocket. Maybe it was Connie's face. Absolute terror on it. But I rammed the letter in my pocket just as... And what does this mean? Please, Miss Ogilvy. And, sir, who are you? She looked at me, and I remembered my fifth grade school teacher. The one who didn't like me. I looked at Connie. There was a desperate, please don't tell look on her face. Barbara was as white as a sheet. I decided to be hung for a sheep as well as a lamb, Miss Ogilvy repeated. Well, sir, if you please. Girls, into your rooms. Yes, ma'am. I'm waiting, sir. Uh, I'm in the wrong house. Really? And for which house were you looking? The, uh, the Smiths. Really? Where do they live? Uh, not here, I guess. I hope you have an explanation. Well, I'm afraid I don't. Hmm. All right, I'm waiting for a streetcar. Will that do? May I have your name? 
If you just forget all about this, I'll go quietly home and lie down for a while. I'm afraid I shall have to ask you to stay. That's very kind of you, Miss Ogilvy, but I have a previous engagement. If you try to leave, I shall ring the alarm and the caretakers will stop you. <sighs> all right. What do you want me to do? Nothing. But I'm going to call the police. <laughs> Holiday. All right. You were in the wrong house. Why? I told you, Kling, I made a mistake. Couldn't you tell a girl's school from a private home? Besides, there's no one in the neighborhood named Smith. How do you like that? 3,000 Smiths in that phone directory, and I picked the wrong neighborhood. You should have worn a ribbon in your hair, but nobody would have noticed you. Thanks, dear. You're pretty, too. Listen, Miss Ogilvy preferred charges, trespassing, and a dozen other counts. She can make them stick. Kling, what if I said I had a good reason for being there, but I couldn't tell what it was? What would you say? The same thing I said two hours ago. Why? I can't tell you. I promised. All right, you'll spend the night in the jug. Unless I put up bail. Which I'll do. I could have told Kling, but I kept thinking about Connie. Maybe I believed her when she said she'd kill herself if I told the police. Anyway, I kept the whole thing to myself. The next morning, I went over the second letter she'd received. It read, you have one more day to get the money from your parents. One more day. That meant today, and that was all. I did a lot of thinking, and it added up to something very, very strange. I was thinking about it when the phone rang, and Susie answered it. Hello? Yes, just a minute. Mr. Holliday, Lieutenant Kling wants to talk to you. Oh? Okay, Susie, thanks. Hello? Yeah? What? When did you hear that? Okay, I'll be right over. Mr. Holliday, what's the matter? You look scared. I am, Susie. Maybe I've made a mistake. Connie McLean's disappeared. <laughs> Back to Damsel in Distress, another Box 13 adventure with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Kling and I drove out to the school. He pondered at me to find out what I knew. I told him about the letter then. I had to. He was mad. I guess he had a right to be. At the school, we sat across from Miss Ogilby and Barbara Rodney. All right, Miss Ogilby. Let's hear what happened. Barbara, please tell us what you know. Well, I... I woke up this morning. Connie and I have the same room. We know that, Barbara. Yes, ma'am. Well, I looked across to Connie's bed. She wasn't there. What time was this, Barbara? When I woke up, about 7.30. And you looked everywhere for her? Oh, yes, Miss Ogilby. What makes you think Connie disappeared? Constance has never been tardy for a class, Mr. Holliday. And I might ask what you know about this. Your actions last Barbara, night Barbara, will not... you leave, please? I'll talk to you later. Hey, Holliday... What's the idea? Please, Kling, I want to learn something. Is it all right, Miss Ogilby? I, uh, I suppose so. I'll be in my room. Now, Mr. Holliday? Shh. Kling, uh, tiptoe to the door. See if she's there. Huh? Please. Okay, okay. <gasps> oh, I, I'm going. I'll be in my room. Well, that's strange. I, I never suspected Barbara would do a thing like that. What's on your so-called mind, Holiday? Some questions. Miss Ogilby, do you know if Connie had many dates? Dates? Yes, parties, dances. No, she didn't. Why? How about Barbara? Yes. They're very close to each other, aren't they? Inseparable. But what is this leading to? I don't know yet. Now about Connie's mother and father. Yes. Do they come to see her often? Not very. They do a great deal of traveling. Uh huh. Thanks, Miss Ogilvy. Now, Holiday, you through playing games? No, not yet. Miss Ogilvy, isn't there some sort of dance coming up soon? I, I think I saw a notice on the bulletin board as I came through. Yes, next week. But really, I don't see how questions like these are going to find Constance. Oh, Kling. Yeah. What now? Are you going to ask me to the dance? Look, Kling, I'll get Connie back here, and no one will know anything's happened. 
If Miss Ogilvy will agree not to press the uh, charges against me for last night. What? Miss Ogilvy, you know it wouldn't be good for the school if this got in the papers, would it? Not at all. Oh, great. The poor kid's disappeared. She got those letters and you're worrying about the school. The letters gave her until tomorrow to get the money. All right, I've got all day. But I want to do this my way. Believe me, it's for Connie's sake. Well? I... Very well. I agree. All right, will you, Kling? Oh, it has to be. Good. If I'm not back in 12 hours, bury me anyway. I was playing a hunch all the way to the finish line. If it worked, okay. If it didn't, then Dan Holliday was cooked like a hot dog at a barbecue. I had a couple of stops to make. The first one was at the Star Times. There I asked Mona, the society editor, a few questions. The McLeans? Are they the ones, Dan? Uh-huh. They got a daughter, Constance. That's right. And a hundred million or so. Where are they now? I can't tell offhand, but... Wait a minute. Back file should tell. Hmm. The Riviera, not here. Nice, not here. Monte Carlo, not here. Mona, please drop the opera glasses and get to the McLeans. <laughs> All right, Danny boy. Let's see. Ah, here we are. Mr. and Mrs. Randolph McLean have left for an extended vacation in Florida. Florida? You sure that's not Michigan? Well, if it is, the Florida Chamber of Commerce is going to be awful mad. Did they return yet? No. You sure? Of course I'm sure. That's my job here, remember? Okay, Mona, thanks. I'll remember you at Christmas. Once a year is all I ask. So long. There was another stop to make. And strange as it may seem, it was to see a psychiatrist. Well, what he told me checked, but good. Then I made one more visit, this time to a telegraph office. I sent a wire to Connie's parents to charter a plane and come home at once. When that was done, I was all set except for one more little item. A long talk with Barbara. I got Miss Ogilvy's permission to take Barbara for a drive in my car. But Mr. Holliday... Why do you want to talk to me? Oh, maybe I just like to, Barbara. Where are we going? Is Smudgy Mary's open in the afternoon now? Yes. Okay. Let's you and I drop in for a lemonade or a malt. How about it? Well, I... I I've really got to get back to school. Miss Ogilvy said it was all right for you to come with me. Oh. You didn't hear Connie leave the room this morning, did you? No, I didn't. And you're sure you looked all over for her? Oh, yes, everywhere. Uh-huh. Well, here's Smudgy Mary's. You know, Barbara, a diet like this will ruin my health. But come on. I... All right. Well, practically deserted. Is that Smudgy Mary? Yes, that's she. Mm-hmm. Two specials, Mary, please. Oh, really, Mr. Holliday, I don't think I can eat Let's any... Let's try the jukebox. Any particular number you'd like? No. Anyone's all right. Okay. Come on, we'll take this table over here. What do you want to talk about? Connie. What about her? Come on, Barbara. Why don't you tell me where she is? Well, because I don't know. I... Well, I'll bet she's been kidnapped. Those awful letters. They said that Those she... letters wouldn't have fooled a baby, Barbara. No kidnapper is going to ask for $1,000, not when the parents are worth millions. Well, maybe... Maybe he was scared. Mm, could be. But that second letter under the door last night, the kidnapper put it there? Well, he must have. Mm -hmm. Well, how did he get in? Well, I, I guess he sneaked in. Barbara, no kidnapper goes around in brightly lighted halls shoving threatening letters under doors. I don't know where she is. Barbara, please tell me. I... <laughs> Tell anyone, will you, Mr. Holliday, please? I'm afraid I'll have to, Barbara. But maybe everything will come out all right. Now we'll save those smudgy Mary specials until later. <laughs> right now, we're going to pick up Connie. How about it? All right, Mr. Holliday. Barbara and I drove out into the country and up where the lake sits in the hills. There were a lot of cabins around... Barbara directed me to one, and I stopped the car. Is it, Barbara? Yes. You wait here. I walked up the path, up the porch stairs. Tried the door. It was unlocked. Who? Mr. 
Mr. Holliday. Hello, Connie. How are you? <laughs> it's all right now, Connie. It's all right. Come on. We'll get back to town. Sure, everything was all right. I drove the two girls back into town. They didn't say a word. I dropped them at the school and then had a long talk with Miss Ogilvy. It was later that night when Lieutenant Kling and I walked into the McLean home. Mr. and Mrs. McLean had called from the airport. They said they'd be home in a few minutes. Connie and Barbara were upstairs. Miss Ogilvy, Kling, and I sat in the big living room. All right, Holiday. How about the plot? Going to give with it? I think we'll wait for the McLeans, huh? There won't be anything in the papers, will there? Mm, that depends on Lieutenant Kling, Miss Ogilvy. Why me? Listen, I still don't know who pulled the snatch. Clay? Oh, uh, I beg your pardon, Miss Ogilvy. What I mean By is... By snatch, uh, you mean kidnapping. Yeah, that's right. You talk English. <laughs> oh, that'll be the McLean's. Miss Ogilvy, would you mind getting the girls down here? Certainly, Mr. Holliday. Connie, Where's I... Where's my daughter? Where is she? Mr. McLean, my name is Holliday. I sent you and your wife that wire this morning. Where is she? Is she all right? Yeah, she's all right. She's coming down to... Mother! Connie! Daddy. Oh, darling. Oh, oh darling, it's Oh, Mr. So Holliday, we're so grateful. So I can't tell you how much. Uh-huh, oh. well, we'll see. Connie. Yes, Mr. Holliday? Would you and Barbara wait outside? We'll only be a minute in here. Yes, sir. Come on, Barbara. Who did it? Who kidnapped her? You did. You and your wife. What? Mr. Holliday. What are you talking about? You're insane. No, I'm not. Now, listen to me. You have a daughter, but no one would ever know it. How often do you see her? I'll see here, Mr. Holliday. About once a year, you put her in a school and forget about her. Except when you think something's happened. Holliday, you can't talk to I'm me. I'm not like finished, Mr. McLean. That kid's lonely. And because she's, well, maybe you call it plain, she doesn't go out very much. Not many dates. I don't see what this is all about. You see, I talked with a psychiatrist today. He used a lot of fancy words, but they boil down to this Connie wants and needs attention and affection desperately. She didn't get them here. So she thought of this scheme. Pretend to be kidnapped. Get attention called to herself. Then she'd come back with the story. She'd be in the limelight. And Barbara helped her because, well, because she's her best friend. Now, wait a minute, Holiday. We'd have torn holes in her story. She wouldn't have gotten away with it. I know. That's why I didn't tell you right away. That's why I wanted to handle it my way. If this had gone to the police, the whole thing would have blown up for Connie. That would have been a newspaper story, ridiculed for the girl. But this way, well, let's give Connie a break. And Barbara, how about it, Clay? I, uh... <laughs> oh, sure, I'm willing. Oh, thanks, Clay. You're a gentleman and a scholar. I'm a soft-hearted cop. Um, Mr. Halliday. Yes, Mr. McLean? I guess my wife and I didn't realize how selfish we really were. We, we thought we were giving Connie all she ever wanted. Yes, all but one thing. The one that really mattered. Affection. Well, I want to thank you and Lieutenant Kling. And, well, now I, I think I'll start what should have been started years ago. Sure. But you've got lots of time. Mind if I, I cut in first? What, what do you mean? Well, you can start tomorrow. Meanwhile, I think I'll play this all the way, huh? What are you up to now, Holiday? Practice what you preach, I always say. Connie. Oh, Connie. Yes, Mr. Holliday? Everything's all right in there. Nothing to worry about. For you either, Barbara. Oh, you're wonderful, Mr. Holliday. Oh, Barbara. Will, uh, will you excuse Connie and me for a moment? Huh? Oh, well, sure. Well, I'll be upstairs, Connie. Connie, about that dance. Got a date for it? Oh, sure, sure I have. Connie? No, I haven't. Well, look, I'm... I'm just a little older than you are, and when I comb my hair and put on a tuxedo, I... I look like I've been in the stag line a bit too long, but... Uh, do I get the date? You? Honest? We'll make a night of it. First the dance, then... Even if it kills me, Smudgy Mary's for a special. Did 
Did you have a good time at the dance, Mr. Holiday? I was the belle of the ball, Susie. Everybody cut in on me to dance with Connie. Uh-huh. <laughs> but you didn't tell me one thing, Mr. Holiday. What's that, Susie? What's a smudgy Mary special? Oh, well, three scoops of chocolate ice cream, three strawberry, two vanilla. Oh. Slice four bananas and embalm them in pineapple syrup and lay them out neatly alongside the ice cream. Pineapple. Strawberry. Uh, let's see now. Oh, pour on two ladles of chocolate syrup, a huge gob of whipped cream. Mr. Holiday, I... Uh, wait. No, wait, wait, wait. Then sprinkle with nuts with a few bits of shells left in and... What's the matter, Susie? I... I ate an awful big lunch. Good night, Mr. Holiday. Ellen Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures. Watch for him in his latest picture, Saigon. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville, with original story by Russell Hughes and original music composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker, and that of Lieutenant Kling by Edmund MacDonald. Production is supervised by Vern Carstensen. This is a Mayfair production from Hollywood. That's it for Case Closed for this week, but visit relicradio.com between now and our next episode to find more old-time radio, thousands of available episodes, more from Sam Spade, Box 13, and our Shoutcast stream with even more to listen to. Plenty there, all available for free thanks to your support. If you'd like to help out, visit donate.relicradio.com or click on the link on the website. You're how it all happens every week. Thanks to those who have helped out. Thanks for joining me today. Be back next Wednesday with Sherlock Holmes. And somebody knows on another episode of Case Closed. Mm-hmm.